Good morning, good morning. Oh, I've got to get out of the way. I'm parked in front of someone. Hard to park out in the road because uh, that's it because someone was going in the paper shop they're funny the papers I uh, buy the papers every morning oh, uh, papers and coffee I find are the two things that patients uh, appreciate uh, I mean proper coffee you know I've said this before I think if you're going to provide anything for patients it has to be sort of reasonably when, when I say high quality it has to sort of be higher than they would get at home you know so if normally they drink instant coffee, then you should you have to give them proper coffee, and uh, they can they can't afford to get the papers delivered every morning, let alone two papers. So what you do is you give them the papers and keeps them happy. Now, not that they wait much. Actually, most of the papers are read by the people who are waiting for the people who are having the treatment. That's the main thing, and then they get the choice of coffee or tea, or peppermint tea or fruit tea or uh, decaffeinated coffee. We've got the lot, so it doesn't. And it costs a few pence and keep it in and, and boil a bit of water, doesn't it? Stick it on it and then just ask them if, if they want something. It uh, goes down really well. The papers we buy are the Times and the Guardian because we want everyone to have sort of something that they'll be prepared to read. I don't know. Uh, the only, I mean, the Guardian is sort of uh, unreservedly the paper of the left wing, uh, sort of libertarian wing. But the uh, Times, I think, is a more difficult choice because I think uh, a lot of people would prefer the Telegraph. Um, I got uh, the Times is very cheap if you buy it on an annual subscription. So basically, I'm just waiting for the annual subscription to run out, and then I shall probably renew the. Uh, I shall probably get the Telegraph. The problem. I mean, I may be as unhappy with the Telegraph as I am with the Times. The Times. The problem with all this, you know, this fake news narrative going on at the moment, it's, it's such a waste of space, print space and TV time, but then, you know, they've got so much to waste, haven't they? You know, it all started because the Democrats got annoyed that somebody probably internally leaked all their emails and, um, and they lost the election because basically people had a real, you know, that it's transparent government at its best, isn't it? They really did see exactly how uh, they they ran. And probably if the Democrats had had their, their emails leaked as well, it would have reflected as badly on them. But uh, they tried to, to uh, you know, uh, smear Trump by saying that he's in league with the Russians. The Russians had done it and, and Trump was a commie sympathiser. Which, which backfired on them because they nobody really believed that and they just said, oh yeah, we got the proof, we just can't give it to you, which most people are not very happy with these days. And then they tried to argue that, uh, you know, that uh, although it all looked pretty genuine and, and almost certainly was genuine, that it wasn't genuine, you know, that it was, uh, that it had all been faked. And that's where fake news came from, you know, the, the uh, democratic allegation that they're leak of their massive email, the Podesta emails, was just uh, uh, fake news. And then, then they, you know, they just degenerated into a complete bun fight over who was lying about what. Well, I mean, I don't know, I don't think people ever bought, you know, like the newspaper magnets like Murdoch, Conrad Black, The Telegraph and all, all the old uh, newspaper magnates. I don't think they ever owned a newspaper because they wanted to report the news. You know, they, they own newspapers because they wanted to make the news. They wanted to influence the population, you know, it gave them a... By telling people, by having a narrative in the modern term, they sort of just influence people and uh, can, as a result, can influence um, politics, which in turn, you know, uh, brings them other benefits, money. And uh, you remember the big battle between uh, Murdoch and various uh, candidates, political parties, you know, where he's 
be supported one side or the other and uh, you know try to be the sort of kingmaker so the times unfortunately I think they their narrative I don't I'm not happy with you know I think they are trying to they don't I don't think they report the news I think they try and make it and I think they tried very very hard so very hard to influence the population to to vote in favor of remaining in the European Union because of their own interests you know they had they had interests that meant that they would be much better off with their nose in the European trough and uh, then uh, again they're you know what they said about Trump they called Trump completely wrong completely wrong and you've got people like Matthew Paris who still won't let it go you know they're still they go through all these phases of saying oh my god you know the British public has made a massive mistake and and then they say well that's because they're not educated they don't know they didn't know it wasn't explained to them properly uh, and then they go through uh, uh, it's all going to be a great disaster, they're going to be a great disaster and and then they try and make it a disaster to prove themselves correct. So I have no, I have no sympathy with the times at the moment. And their bloody app on my phone, which is how I read the paper, because I don't get a chance to read it when I get to work, I, I read it in the morning on my phone. And literally I just skim through it, I mean for every hundred articles I might read one or two. And. Uh, and he keeps saying to me, what do you think about the Times? What do you think? Are you enjoying reading the Times? Are you enjoying reading the Times? And I've answered yes, I've answered no, and there's still this bloody thing won't go away. So now I just ignore it. And this thing popping up all the time just made me more determined to cancel the Times. So there's a lesson. Be careful with your market research. You're just going to end up really causing your customers to be fed up you know don't do too much of it so I had a nice weekend sorry uh, not to talk anything too dental at the moment I mean I suppose marketing and customer relations are, are, de are dental in a way it's my grandson's uh, first birthday you know when people say to you when, when's your youngest memory and you think oh well, I don't know six four going to school but um, I'll tell you what I've learned from my grand grandchildren, and that is that most of my earliest memories were probably from when I was a few months old, below below one. And uh, but I didn't realise that they were memories at the time until I saw my grandchildren go through the experience, and I thought I remember that. I remember that. You know, I remember not wanting to put my shoes on. I remember, I remember being annoyed when people kept putting things over my head and taking things off of my head all the time. I remember being really hot and not being able to do anything about it. And I thought, oh my God, you know, I mean, you know, it's, I had a sort of idea that my, my memory switched on like, a, like at three years old. All of a sudden, a part of your brain says, okay, right, you're going to start to remember a few bits now. But it's not like that, you know, you're you're constructed out of these basic basic building blocks and you remember the, the original ones you know it's really weird my brother-in-law we had all, all the family was over including my brother-in-law he's a, a very successful individual went into business left school early went into business made a lot of money in business uh, selling Sorry, something's rattling. Basically selling uh, nuts and bolts at a time when Margaret Thatcher was building Canary Wharf. So, and there was a big demand for building supplies and everything, so, so he's done very well. And uh, never expected him to. Never expected him to. Make no bones about it. I don't think he expected himself to. You know, he's... He's one of these guys, I don't know, who was it who wrote that Black Swan book? The, um, the Economist, who said that, uh, you know, you shouldn't be jealous of uh, Alan Sugar and, uh, and Bill Gates because they, they, it's a complete fluke that they are as rich as they are. And in, 
Alan Sugar's case, I can absolutely agree with that. I think Alan Sugar, there's no way Alan Sugar should be worth anything at all. His, his stuff has been absolute junk from the day he started making Amstrad computers to uh, right the way through to every other thing he's ever made, the Amstrad TV set-top boxes. When when you get Sky, you don't really get a choice of which box. They have several manufacturers and you don't get a choice of which box you get. They just tell you which box you're going to get. And and uh, so you can go from one made by, by somebody half decent to getting an Amstrad box. And oh my God, do you notice the difference? You know, the lag in the response time, the, uh, the fact that it just doesn't seem to do what you want to unless you stand on the controls. It's <laughs> and it's no wonder they never asked you what type of box you want because everyone will say, I don't care as long as it's not an Amstrad. You know, Amstrad, the Allen, Allen whatever sugar trading company, Amstrad, was was basically just a you know uh, he he made his money originally from what I can remember just selling cheap computers and uh, you know but like making uh, um, how can I put it uh, he he would like look at what IBM was doing and and the IBM PC and he would do something that was so sort of less expensive, but anybody in the know knew was was completely rubbish, was completely crap. And uh, he made an emailer for people who didn't want a computer but thought that they had to be on email. So, and there's this little thing that sort of sat on the hall table with a tiny little screen that you could press buttons and uh, send an email, and it charged you per email. You know, like if you want to send an email, like you had to stick a stamp on it and send it off. <laughs> so, that was the most ridiculous thing he ever made. Anyway, yeah. So, uh, so apparently, uh, most rich people get rich richness thrust upon them. But uh, of course, most dentists go the other way, don't they? They go. Uh, they, you know, they they're firmly on the academic path. I mean, they these are the guys who and girls who sit at the front of the class who, uh, you know, continually are trying to get the best score in the exams, do well, and then there's no doubt that they're always going to go on to the next stage, you know, so are you going to take as many O-levels as you can? Yeah, of course you are. Um, once you've finished your O-levels, are you going to go on to do A-levels? Yeah, of course you are. And once you've done your A-levels, will you be going to university? Yeah, of course I will, you know. The, the, your path is predefined. Well, he was, he was sort of washing about sort of flotsam and jetsam on the industrial scene I was I was I was the 747 on the runway ready to take off <laughs> and so and it worked out well for both of us I mean I can't complain you know I mean uh, but uh, just to you know a cautionary word of warning and a lot of entrepreneurs will tell you this which is that you're you're um, you know you're not guaranteed to earn a lot of money by, by pursuing the academic route. I mean, stri on the strict academic route, if you stay in academia, you're almost guaranteed not to earn a lot of money. But if you think to yourself a degree is going to be a... Whoa! A degree is going to be a route to financial success, then, then it isn't. And as a lot of entrepreneurs will tell you, um, not getting a degree actually might be a faster route to success. I've had, um, the viewers have asked me why I wear two pairs of glasses and, and the answer is obviously I don't wear two pairs of glasses. I've tried to wear two pairs of glasses but it actually doesn't work. Actually, yeah, that's a, actually, that's a big improvement. I think I might do that but I better not. Anyway, and the answer is, obviously like most elderly people, I am, uh, what, what happens when you get, I'm going to be 58 this year, yeah. I know, I know, you don't have to say it. I don't look it. <laughs> I've had an easy life. That is true, but it is true. I'm going to be 58, and so, and I was short-sighted. I've always been short-sighted. In fact, it was a big uh, advantage to me when I was young because I couldn't see the blackboard. And so, when the teacher was writing stuff on the blackboard, I had to memorise it all because. <laughs> so when I went to music lessons, for example, 
they would have the words on the blackboard <clears throat> and um, everyone in the class could see them except me so so I'd have to memorize all the so <laughs> memorize all the lyrics and people would go oh god you know this song really well and I'm like yeah yeah why not <laughs> why don't you you know <laughs> surely you can't see the words either <laughs> so it sort of gave me a memory trick when I was really young and then and then they found out that uh, I was short-sighted and finally got me fitted up with some glasses and then I'm like oh my god <laughs> I you don't need to learn the words they're on the blackboard <laughs> <coughs> oh dear I have to give up facts so yeah so <clears throat> So I'm short-sighted, and then all of your life they say to you, you're going to uh, get more long-sighted as you get older. So I'm thinking, great, fantastic, eyesight that cures itself. As I get older, I'm going to get, my sight's going to get better. So, and sure enough, it is true, you do get a bit more long-sighted, but what they don't mention is also is that your um, ability to focus over long distances diminishes so you get a, a shorter range of, of a field of view becomes shorter so although you get more long-sighted you still need a variety of lenses because you can't your your ciliary muscles whatever they're called can't squeeze your lens your lens becomes less flexible and so um, so it's your your uh, you know you can't see at short distances and long distances because you just can't accommodate it so you have to have a variety of lenses and I tried to wear bifocals and, and really didn't like them at all and uh, so I wear two pairs of glasses now actually I've got three operating modes for the mark one eyeball works in three modes one is extreme short distances which is basically working distances so I work with my glasses off and then I've got short short range glasses for uh, looking at the computer and then long range glasses for driving and, and whatever but I get this uh, a curious situation where if I'm wearing the long range glasses I can see where I'm going and I can see what's coming the other way but I can't read the speedometer and if I wear my short range glasses I can see how fast I'm going but I can't see if I'm going to hit anything so uh, so what pair should I wear? This is the question. This is my question for you today. What should I wear? The pair where I might get caught for speeding and I might be going fast but at least I can see what I'm going to hit or should I wear the short range pair where I can stay within the speed limit but if I'm going to hit something I don't see it until it's three feet from the bonnet. <laughs> oh dear. Just in case anyone right is taking this all seriously and thinks, ah, oh, this is it, I've got him, I've got him. I'm gonna send this YouTube video off to the pl I've got him on videotape admitting that he can't see where he's driving. This is a humorous channel, okay? Can I just say for those of you who don't have a sense of humour, including the, the the person who reported me to the General Dental Council for making a joke in Dental Practice magazine, you know, you humorless bastard. Just don't even think about it, okay? This is a humorous channel and nothing that I say is designed to be taken seriously, including the dental advice. In fact, especially the dental advice. <laughs> so, what have we talked about? Absolutely nothing. I've got all the way to work and I haven't even, well, I've touched dentistry a bit. If only to say, don't rely on dentistry to make you money anymore. I mean, the reason why I sort of went that way was because at one point the dental profession was respected. We were in the top decile of earnings, which for those of you, you know, who don't know what a decile is, it means that the, the, pay, the pay review body routinely made sure we were in the top 10% of earners by virtue of the skills that we exercise, you know, the, the manual dexterity, the financial acumen and the academic skill. Um, but then, but then one year they just decided that we didn't deserve to be there, and so that was it. We were sort of left to the vicissitudes of the free market. And vicissitudes is a long. Hello, go on, yeah, go on, just stay there right behind me. So, and the reason for that is, I think. Um, 
you know, it's got a lot to do with the respect that we have as a profession now, or the much less respect we have as a profession. And perhaps I'll cover that, you know, and, and the sort of the downfall. The rise and fall of the dental profession. I might cover that tomorrow. Anyway, I'm going to go to work now. You have a nice day, all right? And I'll uh, see you tomorrow, perhaps. All right, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.